Okay. So we're going to have, this is just going to be a class on its own. This is something I found to be a cornerstone of being a good mechanic, making money for people and making money for yourself. So this is more of an administrative class about how I go about my process of, um, of the repair. Some of this is from training I've received and some of it's added on, obviously, from just years of experience. But there has to be a process, guys. And if you stick to that process, you're going to always you're going to find, first off, that you're more consistent uh, with your repairs. And that after I mean, anyone in working any job who gets things down to processes finds that there are more efficient ways to do things. I saw a guy the other day pressure washing the all the flesh off of a hide. And everyone's saying, that's just genius. Never heard of it, never seen it. And so there's so many things that we don't know. And, you know, good students are willing to learn things. And this is going to be a good class for good students. It might be a little long, but uh, this is uh, information that's, first of all, going to cover your ass, get you paid, and see to it, like I said, that you become more and more efficient over time. So let's just start with block number one. And really what we're going to cover today is we're going to cover, like I said, the process. I have it broken down into eight, nine steps. All right. So I've made a few notes here uh, in a little bit um, more better or better preparation to give you more information uh, than thinking about it later and just shooting from the hip. So the customer interview or questionnaire, the reason why this is the first step is because so many problems, guys, so many problems could be solved by just the right question being asked to the guy when he drops off the vehicle. If you walk out there with the individual and you have him show you or recreate the problem, then you know the right sequence the switches have to be in or whatever the, the, the common denominators are, right? You're trying to figure out what does the driver know about when does it do this? Does it do when it's hot? Does it do when it's driving over gravel roads? Do, you know, is this something that happens after a cold soak for the night and or after the truck has been sitting for two days? Does it lose fuel prime? Is it extended crank when start? You know, these types of things are, are invaluable. And if just as a, as a whole, these are things to consider. And if you're involved in the trades, as far as like selling the work or um, in the administrative side of it at all, this is the most important thing you can do for the mechanic as a service writer is to go and verify how it happens. That way, when you hand out that RO, you can go out with the, with the technician and say, hey, um, I was able to have him show me when and how it does this and, and recreate the problem for the technician right then and there. That could save hours and hours of debate and lost time for the mechanic. So make sure we're verifying, uh, or first of all, doing the customer interview and getting doing the 20 questions, all right? Finding out what it is specifically that you need to know. Um, and details matter more than you would think. There might be something about that you might just ask, like I said, is it does it do it when it's hot? And they would have never said that to the service writer uh, right then and there. And when you ask a service writer, does it do it when it's hot? He now knows, hey, maybe I should be asking these few more questions. So this is just a way of kind of opening the communication and getting more information for you as the guy who has to go and diagnose these problems. So the first thing we do is we verify as a mechanic, we verify and recreate that problem. All right. You get one hour to do this. There is no ifs, ands, or buts. This is all the time that you get. This is why jobs get buried. If service managers wanted to take this class with me, it would behoove them because from my side is where all the rubber meets the road. And then in management, I understand, but a lot of service managers don't understand that these are processes that, uh, that if they taught their guys that stop after one hour, we cannot make money verifying a complaint um, or verifying, uh, fixing something we cannot verify or recreate. So like I said, if you can do that with the customer, if possible, that's great. Cause then they know you took the time to have them show you this is a problem. When you're dealing with the, the diesel industry, it's not like cars are not all backed up. There's not just an RO sitting on there. These are people. This is their livelihood. A lot of them is their homes. So they are very involved in the repair. And that behooves you to listen to them because they know a lot about what's going on. I mean, they put 8 to 12 hours a day behind the wheel of that rig. And if you ask them, they'll tell you more than you think. So um, I also have a note here to approve more time and document who you spoke with when you approve more time to diagnose a problem. So this, this process is the repair process, but specifically when I'm verifying and recreating, I stop at one hour to make sure I cover my business's ass. And then I cover my own ass by not burying a job and not having an answer. So I approve more time and then I document. Now, if I, there are certain things that are only going to uh, pay so much time as far as troubleshooting, but what I want to do, well, I'll go into the next thing. So 
Uh, troubleshoot the system I have here as the next and always start from the easiest to most difficult. Write down your findings and report what you know and, if, and get more time. Make clear um, where the money slash labor dollars, uh, where the spending, what they were spending it on is, is something so that they can know something more, not just to keep fumbling your way through it, hoping to find the problem. So if I call the customer back after an hour and I say, or, you know, after troubleshooting the system, it takes me maybe three hours, four hours. Sometimes this can cost more than the repair now. And I don't think it's something we should just give away. We, sh we should be paid for our diagnostic time because these are very complex systems. But we have to do it in a way that's palatable for a customer and also that earns for the mechanic. So this is covering your time. Um, troubleshoot and uh, map the circuits or the troubleshooting steps. This is the kind of stuff and reference material you're going to use. You're not just going to wing it. Um, obviously, experience will dictate how much you know about it already. But when you do this circuit mapping and this troubleshooting steps, what you'll find is that after too long, you will know those steps. And then you'll be that guy with the experience, but you won't have walked down the right path to get to those answers unless you start with the materials that are available, like circuit mapping. I want to know before I touch anything wiring wise, what I should be looking for. Now, I can always just write down my readings wherever I find them and then go find out what those readings mean with the schematic. But unless you understand the logic or the interplay between 15 different wires going maybe to five different splices, I mean, guys, that's 100 wires, 25, 50 wires. That's very difficult to troubleshoot systematically, right? So we single out circuits and we troubleshoot it that way. But the way that you single out circuits is by knowing what job they have in the, in the, in the big picture, right? In the system. But you don't know that unless you've mapped the circuits and you understand the logic. So this is really important. to go. And I can't stress that enough. This is what makes the difference between technicians and parts changers, guys. I get lucky maybe 80% of the time. But if I know what I'm doing, I, I, I always have the answer. And the problem is that, like I've said many times, the 80% is good. But what about when you're faced with that 20? Then you need to have a process. So if you always use the process, you'll always bill out 100% of your time because there's a way to cover your time. And no mechanics with his tool bill and his skill and, and, and technical abilities should be put in a position where they're giving away their time on a flat rate and, and losing diagnostic time in this day and age. The diagnostic time at times uh, can be just as con time consuming as a repair. Um, it's not like looking at an old carbureted engine and saying clearly, oh, you need a new choke, right? Now, now we have to troubleshoot a modulated valve that is pulse width modulated from a computer that's $3,000. And we can do that efficiently, but you got to have to go through the service literature. There's no fumbling your way through this job anymore, especially not in the realm of being a diagnostician. Figuring out problems, the most expensive guy in the shop. Um, so I wrote here that it is on the tech, it's on the mechanic to make clear that the money and that they're spending in labor is something that is providing you the time to figure out problems and test things and have findings. So when you have your findings is when you call the customer. And if you can't find anything, then you need more time, then you need to tell them what you've done so far and your findings thus far. I've owned out said wires. There's 12 of them in the harness. I've got three done so far. I've checked every bit of that circuit. Now I need to go to circuit number four through 12. That's gonna cost me another two hours. Write that time down. Get your time covered. This is how to do it. Uh, you are the duty expert. Make a call or get more time. Make a call. Say what you know. This is not a free service to diagnose, diagnose anymore and uh, often takes a long time, especially if you're a diagnostician who is put up against a problem-solving job. That's what you do is you solve problems. So your part of solving, uh, solving the problem, it, it, as a diagnostician, you might find if you do it as a business, you're gonna go to places that they've done work before on the vehicle. It might make it more difficult. So without a system, a, a systematic approach, you're not gonna get there, or it's gonna be quite a, a lot more difficult. Um, so the next part we have is step four, and that's diagnose the root cause of failure, failure analysis. If it's progressive failure, meaning that more parts failed than they should have because the thing went too long, then you need to prove what the root cause of failure and how that affected the failure of those progressive parts. So that's another way you do this. And, and something that is key is the customer has the right to his parts that you took off. And this would mitigate all the people worried about us stealing or not doing work 
and claiming that we did. All you got to do is save the parts and give them to the customer or throw them in the bin, but wait till they tell you to. In California, this is a law, and there's a lot of other places that it really should be a federal law. There should be no claim of what you did unless you return those failed parts. Even on the cores, you should keep them until the customer comes back. He pays the core, takes the core. I mean, work out the cores when you close the bill because the cores often will equate to having an answer about how something failed that you don't have access to anymore once you've turned it back over to that um, the parts the parts chain. So um, some people want to uh, prove. Oh yeah, okay. So repair to spec. So we're going to use OEM parts or no warranty on parts. And that's just kind of my own personal note. And the only warranty work that returns to you for failure analysis first is the stuff that you're going to warranty. Unless they keep the parts or provide them for you, but you will find that shops will go after you if you're in business for yourself at, uh, and do a repair and then start to condemn, you know, things that I've just found a lot of people try to skate by, uh, you know, squeeze by without being held accountable for either things that vehicle parts that went on their vehicle or shops that made repairs where they shotgun parts at it. So this mitigates the whole thing. You just keep all the parts. Um, verify proper operation. Obviously, after we make our repair, uh, through the ranges of load. So I don't want to just make a repair and then just ship it after I took it around the, the block. I want to put it back on the road, put it through a load. If I need to contact the customer to make sure that I can verify that the repair was done well, that's fine with him. Guaranteed. They're going to come pick it up. They're going to go for road tests. They're going to say, no, man, it's good. Or no, 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 no. You see right there. And then it's still in your bay. The work you've done, you've already proven that you only replace failed parts, right? Because you can prove that you tested them uh, and, and you're walking through it in that, in that way. I had a, a note here. I won't bore you with it, but... Essentially, that's very important. Um, okay, here it is. Let's do this first. So we're verifying proper operation through the load ranges and then quality control. If you can make this someone else aside from yourself, somebody objective where you have a second party to come in and say, no, I checked it too. He, he, it, it, it worked for me too because some things happen. But the more people who are involved in the, in the transparency of that, the less question there is whether or not mechanics are juicing people for their money. And the number eight... And probably my favorite is to document the process. And I'll tell you why it's my favorite, um, but I want to, uh, I'm going to talk about that on its own. So uh, nine is a tech write-up. So you have to be able to substantiate the amount of labor that you've put in it and document your findings, the specifications. If you did a um, wheel bearing because you had an ABS fault, then you need to make sure you you annotate on your, on your work order or your cause correction, um, well, three C concern cause correction sheets that tech write-ups get. If if you write down on there, hey, end play was set to, that covers your butt, covers the, the boss's butt. It makes sure that they know, too, that you spent your time doing that good labor time doing, like checking the end play and giving them a really accurate reading of what their their um, torque was or what end play was, right, on the bearing load. So um, when we go to documentation of the process, that's so important to me because this is where you get to have the opportunity to put together resources for future diagnosis and repair. So when you're pulling all those schematics, they can just sit in the back of a folder or you can take an extra minute just like you would your toolbox to get it straight, get a three ring binder, get this stuff, get it laminated if it's a schematic, start getting these documents because you might think that that's time not well spent. That time will shape hours and hours and hours later on when you start to reference those materials and it pops back in like this. You can't keep everything in there, right, guys? So the smart guy knows where to find the answer. And if you're the smart guy, because you you kept the answer. So um, print it out. If you work for a shop, they got money to pay for paper. Print your stuff out. And then, it, you know what? If that's your work and what you've been doing, maybe you can buy your own reams of paper and see if they'll let you print them. But keep them. Keep those damn books. Um so, it, it, but it will seem time consuming. Like a lot of people don't do the documentation part of this job very well at all. They may fix things like a, a wizard, but, and it would almost behoove the service writer to sit down with the tech and just type out what he says, to be honest. And it doesn't matter how long it takes because that, okay, there's three things here that happen when you document the repair. You, first of all, you have a maintenance record for the customer, which they're very grateful. Truck drivers have a better resale value for a maintenance record. 
They have better references when they're all over the country to look at their rec- uh, maintenance records and say, this was the tech write-up on that EGR valve failure that happened 600 miles ago. And then you come to find out why the EGR valve failed later on. It's because it had burnt pins or too much resistance in the, in the ground or however that happened. But you can make those. I know now that's why you see, otherwise you wonder like that doesn't happen. You know, they don't fail that quickly. Maybe on a, on a, on an OEM Cummins EGR valve, they do fail quickly though. Um, and so cover your ass for legal. So in truth, I got taught a lot of this stuff by really seasoned old school guys who I mean, there is dealerships have to haggle with a lot of people in court over things, right? Lost like downtime, you know, the repairs taking too long, you know, the improper repairs. Some people just go into dealerships to try to soak them to get the job done and then never pay. Okay. So if you know that's the kind of people inside of that industry, then you're going to cover your butt as a, as a, just as a mechanic and make sure you're writing down that, you know, Hey, this is what I did. Um, anyway, documentation is everything. And when they enter that into that work order in the shop, then they also have something to go to court with when that wheel falls off and you wrote there specifically what the end play was and what the spec was. And they got to call it an act of God because otherwise they're going to dispute you. But it's an automatic fail in that courtroom. Keep talking to this side. It's an automatic courtroom, uh, courtroom fail if you don't have that support documentation. That's the way it works. So that is good enough to cover your boss. And you know what? You cover his body, he'll probably cover yours too. All right, so I hope this is helpful as far as the process that I use to go about making a repair. And as far as using it as a billable hour, this is the best way to do it to account for your time and make sure you're not losing a lot on the back end. Okay, thank you again, guys. Have a good night.